It's my great honor today to introduce Dr. Samuel Seward, Professor and Chair of Medicine. For those who don't know, Dr. Seward has spent most of his career caring for adult survivors of the congenital disease hermansky foodlack Syndrome, or HPS. But Dr. Seward does not just care for these patients in a vacuum. He has dedicated his life to making their lives better. He does this by being alongside his patients, most of whom he has known for years, but also leading the way internationally in innovations of clinical care and participation in research into the pathogenesis and treatment of this disease. He is currently on the board of directors of the International Foundation, known as the HPS Network. He has been a member of the HPS Clinical Trials Network, and he co-chaired the HPS Scientific Advisory Conference for five years. As recognition for all of his work, he has received numerous awards, including the Doctor of the Year Award and the Leadership Award from the HPS Network. I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of Dr. Seward's many accomplishments since joining us in 2016. He has been instrumental in stabilizing the Department of Medicine and moving us forward. He has recruited several division chiefs, our residency program director and our executive director, along with numerous key faculty, resulting in the depth of clinical expertise now present within each division. Under his leadership, several new service line projects and programs have been created and are thriving, including the GI Motility Center, the Outpatient Antimicrobial Therapy Program, known as OPAT, and the forthcoming multi-specialty outpatient site at Morningside, to name just a few. But I think through all of this, Dr. Seward has put his relationships with his faculty and trainees first. He insists on meeting individually with every new faculty member to not only get to know them, but also to introduce himself as an approachable mentor and leader. In certain ways, his relationships with his patients mirror his relationships with our faculty and trainees. I have reason to believe that he not only knows the intricate medical details of all his HPS patients, but he knows each patient as a person. Dr. Seward's interest in HPS and other rare diseases demonstrates his dedication towards those with less of a collective voice, and we are proud to have him as our leader and speaker today. Dr. Seward? Thank you, Amy. I really uh, won my heart. I, I thank you very much. I appreciate it. And um, you'll hear a little bit more about HPS in my talk, but it certainly has been central and, and it's extremely meaningful part of my career and all the ways that Amy described so eloquently. So thank you very much, Amy. Before we get started, I did want to, first of all, thank everyone for being here. This really is my favorite topic. Uh, this is a new talk for me, and it's really um, an honor for me to share, share the information I'm about to with you, and I'm grateful for your interest. But I also want to call out a great day yesterday. It was match day, as I think probably everyone on the call knows. And we just did wonderfully, both in terms of our own fellowship programs and matching into those, and also in terms of where our third year residents and our current chief residents are heading next. It was a remarkable list. We'll share it with you in greater detail. As you all know, Dr. Andrilli always does a, a residency uh, summary as one of our talks during our grand round series. So that will be one opportunity. And we'll put together a compendium as well so we can share this wonderful information. But I do want to congratulate all of our trainees. I want to also congratulate all of our faculty and leadership. Uh, we provide great mentorship to our trainees really across the spectrum of all that we do. And, and, and I think our trainees would be the first to say they would not have met with the same success without the wonderful support of our faculty. So thank you and congratulations. Okay, David, we can get started. So I do not have any industry relationships. I really never have. It's just not the path that my career has taken. It's not that I'm cynical at all about industry relationships, but I just don't happen to have any. As Amy mentioned, I have served for a couple decades, and I was one of the founding directors of the, of the board for the hermansky pudlak Syndrome Network. And for almost as long, I've served on the scientific advisory for the network. Uh, these are entirely voluntary positions. I receive no compensation for them. However, as I mentioned, I do get a meal once in a while. And uh, more substantively, we have an international conference every year, and they always cover my 
hotel. I've asked them not to, but they insist. So that's, those are my conflicts. Our learning objectives. I, I do want to talk about rare diseases. I want to share with you a few. Um, there's lots and I've shown you those numbers before and I will again, but we'll, we'll go through a few of them kind of for fun, but also because I think they each will give us an important learning point in terms of how to think about rare diseases in the broader world of medicine. Um, I'm also going to talk some about what it means to be an internist in my view of some of our core beliefs and our core tools that we keep in our toolkit and encouraging folks to hold on to those in their busy demanding careers. I want to talk about career paths and again Dr. Rosenberg was very kind about talking about mine. I don't think mine is extraordinary. I do think it's a nice example of a way that one can integrate the care of patients with rare diseases into a career that will then be very meaningful. We can go on, thank you. So there's some numbers for, these are population numbers. Uh, you probably know them. So there's about 7.8 billion people in the world right now. And it's estimated around 331 million in the United States. And by 2050, 9.9 .9 billion and 438 million. That's the highest number for the United States. It's as low as 389, that estimate. The reason I share it is a couple of things. First of all, just as a point of interest, I suspect for everybody, it's for people that do this kind of work, um, the carrying capacity of the earth is thought to be around nine to 10 billion. So we're getting there, we're getting there fairly quickly. And when we see that moment, I think we'll all know in, in, a, a, in really a myriad of ways. But also to say in terms of rare diseases, and again, at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll just share those numbers with you again. There are indeed millions of people living with rare diseases. And I would submit to all of you, it is a rare month for those with really busy clinical practices, maybe a rare week that you aren't seeing a patient with a rare disease. You may not conceptualize them that way. They may not have been diagnosed yet, but believe me, they're out there and you're seeing them frequently. This is a really favorite quote of mine. Evolution requires imperfect fidelity of replication. It comes from Bill Gall, uh, who's a great friend of mine, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, Bill in a minute. But it makes the point, which I think sometimes we forget in medicine, candidly, and then we forget in internal medicine. We kind of think about and tend to focus a lot of our energies around the big problems, CHF, diabetes, obesity, coronary artery disease. And in doing so, I think we provide wonderful care to patients struggling with those important and really life-changing syndromes. But I would submit to you also in doing so, we sometimes neglect the fact that mutations are happening all the time. Spontaneous mutations, inherited mutations are happening all the time. And they're really part of evolution and they're central to really the diversity of humanity and also its capacity to continue to exist. Okay, here's my first case. We're gonna do a bunch of cases. So you graduated from your program and I will tell the more senior faculty, it really wasn't my intention when I put this talk together, but as I was reviewing it and getting ready for today, I realized that the core audience I had in mind was our trainees and also our, our more junior faculty who perhaps just completed their training themselves. And so you'll get a little bit of that bias as we go through it, but I hopefully it'll be interesting for everybody. So this. You, you've just graduated, you, for whatever reason that's important for you, family perhaps, or, or assistance with loans, you're working in rural New York in an FQHC, and a 20-year-old gentleman walks in with chronic abdominal pain or discomfort. He thinks his skin has changed. The reason he thinks that is because friends and family have pointed out he's now for the first time, and he, this is really disturbing to him, having some trouble with stairs, and he has this kind of chronic fatigue that's gone on for a long time. And he's seen a number of healthcare providers to talk about it. Next slide. You examine them and this is what you see. You know, this is a classic finding and you, it jumps out at you when you examine him in the, in the office. Next slide. Okay, so this is our first quiz and David's gonna manage the quiz. You, you know that you, you have a pretty strong suspicion, you know what the diagnosis is and I'm not gonna say it just yet, 
and you're trying to decide what test you should order, and this is kind of the first teaching point. So let's take a moment to allow you to make that decision. David, if you have yep. to tell people how to do it. So um, you just know people are voting. Just click on the option okay. you prefer okay. and I'll see when we have enough votes. Uh, we'll give a little bit less than a minute, just so everyone can. Uh, we have, um, I think, five or six of these, so get ready for an interesting hour. <laughs> Okay, I think well, people are still voting. Okay, it's been 40 seconds. I'm gonna stop the voting. And I'm gonna share the results. You can see them on the screen, correct? Very nice, very nice. That is correct. Serum ceruloplasmin is the most specific for the diagnosis of Wilson's disease. And it, this is the first teaching point. We're not gonna spend any more time on Wilson's but really in the context of rare diseases or just in the context of medicine, as everyone knows, there's a host of tests one might order for a patient. And it's important to think about, particularly if you're in the realm of diagnosis, what's the most specific, what's gonna get me most efficiently and most reliably to a diagnosis for the patient. You could do an abdominal MR, you could do an MR of the brain. I mean, he's got neurologic symptoms, so there may well be MRI findings of the brain as well. You could do an ECG, which could show you, you know, classically LV hypertrophy, sometimes biventricular hypertrophy. You could do the serum ceruloplasmin. 90% of patients with, with Wilson's will have an abnormal less than 20 milligrams per deciliter, and that is the most specific test. So if you have the Kaiser Fleischer rings, you have an abnormal serum ceruloplasmin, and you also have urinary. So urinary is important. The reason it's not as specific is it can be seen in other cholestatic disease. And for urinary, if you're excreting more than 100 micrograms, I believe, per deciliter of ceruloplasmin, that, that's uh, diagnostic as well. But if you have that triad, Kaiser Fleischer, serum, and urine, you've got your diagnosis. Okay, David. Okay, so, so here's the next part, and this is a separate teaching point. It's, as I say, not necessarily specific to Wilson's, but in the broad range of genetic disorders, including, for example, genetic, uh, genetically associated malignancies, cancer or um, you know, mutational counseling can play a very important role, and I think many of you will have heard me talk about this before, before and I believe that it's central to really great care when you can access it, but you can't always access it. So your patient and his partner are thinking about having a child and he wants to know what he should tell his partner. Next slide. And we're gonna do a quiz again. I'll read the answers to you as you're deciding. The first is you'll be fine. Wilson's is a rare disease and it is indeed rare. In the United States, rare is defined as less than 200,000 people known to have a disease at a given point in time. So it's indeed rare. And because it is so rare, you really don't have to worry about passing it on. The second option is your risk of passing it on is related to whether your partner also carries the gene. And there's no way to know if your partner does. So there's no, no real testing that should be done. The third option is this disease is most commonly inherited recessively which means if your partner is also a carrier, with each pregnancy, there's a 25% chance of you're having an affected child, someone with the disease. And then the fourth is, I don't advise having children. Dr. Seward, I think that your first comment about the earth only holding 10 billion people is gonna make everyone vote. I do not advise having children. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> okay. So people are voting. I think it took longer because options are a bit longer in this one. Okay, I'm gonna stop the voting. There you can see the results. All right, all right. This is a classic example, if you don't know, and I'm, you, you knew, so I'm not accusing you of anything, but you know, the longest answer is often the correct one, right? And, and indeed, the third option is, is the, the correct answer. The fourth, you know, and now I'm gonna go into, you know, Samuel Seward opinion making. Uh, the fourth is, I don't think 
my own view is I don't think physicians should ever be putting them, certainly not intern, and should ever be putting themselves in the position of telling patients not to have children. Um, I think sometimes we can get involved when there's risk associated for the mother, and we can have a role in that. But certainly in terms of one's risk of, of transmitting an inheritable genetic disease, I don't really think that's a place we should find ourselves telling people emphatically, don't, don't do that. Um, people make lots of decisions. They're always very personal. And I, I'm just sharing my opinion. I don't believe that's our role. Okay, David. So we won't run through this, but just to remind you, Punnett Square, this is one of the ways, if I'm doing the counseling myself, I will try to bring the reality home for patients. The biggest challenge I have is, first of all, just the healthcare literacy in our country. And people really just don't have an understanding that there's 22 pairs of autosomes and two sex chromosomes. You know, they, these kinds of basic things are not well understood, even by well-educated folks in the country. Um, the other thing, the other challenge I find is that, and I put it in the, in the answer that was correct, people taking in this with every pregnancy. So it's not just, you know, if you have four kids, only one potentially. It's really with every pregnancy that 25% chance exists for a recessive disorder. Okay, David. So this is Barbara McClintock, and she won the 2008 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for her contributions. I am going to, I'm including her and I include another major contributor later in my talk to make a separate point that I just think is important. And that is that we sometimes forget what an incredible place women have had in genetics, in medicine. And Professor McClintock, you know, she was the person that described, uh, um, oh my goodness, jumping genes, you know, they, 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 what's, what's colloquially colloquially called jumping genes, and again, won the Nobel Prize. Um, there tends to be in genetics a real emphasis on male contributions, and all of you know the story of, of, of the description of the human genome and who gets the most credit for that, and everyone had an important role to play, but I, I just wanted to make sure I gave, I gave some life to uh, someone such as Professor McClintock. Next slide, David. Okay, so separate Nobel Prize, and this is going to be another quiz, 2019 Medicine and Physiology, which rare disease was instrumental in the research related to it? People are still voting, so we'll give them a chance to cast their ballots. And you can't look up on your phones. <laughs> okay, five more seconds. Okay. <clears throat> Sharing the results. Okay, kind of an even mix, which doesn't surprise me. Um, the correct answer is the first, von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. And the recipients of that prize, the 2019 prize, were Kaylin, Ratcliffe, and Semenza. And uh, it was um, Kaylin who worked with the, with the von Hippel-Lindau population and it helped describe the VHL gene, which is the mutation that is responsible for the syndrome. Um, and some of, our, some of the folks in the room may well know VHL because it can be associated with certain tumors such as field chromocytomas, for example. But, but the larger question they were trying to answer was the role of the EPO gene um, and its impact in just in tissues and responses to hypoxia, but also as it related to certain risks for certain types of malignancies. But really it was Kalen's work with the VHL gene and looking at patients who had an abnormal gene and those who didn't and how that helped regulate EPO. And I'm kind of generalizing broadly, as you probably can tell, that was instrumental in ultimately this very important uh, contribution. Okay, David. And this is just a young lady with, with Von Hippel-Lindau, uh, Stacy Lloyd, uh, quite, 
famous in that time. So you can get um, hemangioblastomas of the CNS, of the retina. Um, I already mentioned you can be at risk for pheocyte chromocytoma, and then you can get um, other, um, all that highly vascular lesions as well. Many of them in strict terms are benign, but have very serious consequences in terms of their symptoms. This is just a walk down history a little bit. Um, for folks not from the US, this slide uh, pictures the Hatfields and the McCoys. I, I think, I don't know if this is the Hatfields or the McCoys, I really don't know, but you'll notice all the weaponry. And, and again, for those not from the US, they're kind of infamous um, really for just this completely immoral, um, you know, familial feud that went on for years and was, you know, was mortal for certain members of both families. I think it's the Hatfields as well. Um, someone looked back because the lineage is fairly well known and then looked at their own, they actually looked to see if they had the VHL gene and they did. And there's this hypothesis that it was pheochromocytoma that was present in this population and issues with managing um, one's emotions and you know and rage and things of this sort that played a role in that in that warring feud. I'm saying no more about the Hatfields and the McCoys. So separate syndrome. We're not going to do this as a quiz, but another option was Treacher Collins. This is Treacher Collins, and it makes a broader point for me, which is, and again, with my with my thought that ultimately I realized in putting this together, I really had a lot of um, intentionality around our trainees, and to make the point, you all know that when you walk in the room. Already, you're in the mode of physical diagnosis, and Treacher Collins, you know, jumps off the page at you. You know, this 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 is uh, Jono Lancaster. Jono is kind of an international star in the Treacher Collins uh, community, and he's also really an advocate for difference and for people that looks diff look different and trying to get through some of this bias that that inevitably exists across the spectrum of human. Um, interactions, including in healthcare, of course. Um, he does have all the classic features in terms of his facies, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this. But again, for the trainees, you can look at the slant of his palpebral fissures, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And his are down slanting, are the, as they are in the little girl on his lap. Um, he's got a very narrow nasal bridge, and a classic feature of Treacher Collins is na narrow nasal passages that are at risk for obstructive sleep apnea for, for functionally mechanical reasons. Um, but this is Treacher Collins. The other thing to know about it is it's not as rare as some rare diseases. It's really a rare six months for me that I don't see someone with Treacher Collins just walking around the city of New York. Um, inevitably, they don't make eye contact because they're, they're in that mode of having to deal with just looking different. But this is Treacher Collins for you. And it brings me to a broader point, uh, which is a challenge for all of us. And you know, we, I, one of the things I find really um, very gratifying about how we talk in medicine is that we talk relatively frequently about cognitive biases and anchoring. And you know, I, I love so many of our senior faculty. And one of the reasons I do, if you think about someone like Janet Shapiro, this is the way she talks to our trainees and talks to her colleagues about things they're seeing in the, in the ICU and elsewhere and trying not to get so anchored to a particular diagnosis that you can't think beyond it. And we have a lot of gratitude, of course, for, of course, for Daniel Kahneman, who wrote that famous book, Thinking Fast and Slow. In the, in the realm of rare diseases, it's really just making the point that you will walk into a room and see a patient and inevitably they will have a host of diagnoses that you're looking at in, in EPIC. Some of them may not be accurate and some of them may not be, may be accurate, but there's never been a real diagnostic um, investigation to support that diagnosis. The most common one for me, and I bring it up all the time, is this distinction between COPD and asthma. And, you know, and, and my ultimately what is my frustration that we don't do PFTs as much as we really should. And you'll meet patients with COPD that really have never had that diagnostic test, you know, and so, but I, I'm trying to make the broader point too, that, that, uh, you know, biases and anchoring are, are challenge for every one of us. 
and certainly in the realm of rare diseases and trying to remember that there are rare diseases that can cause common symptoms, it's important. Okay, different patients. And David, in a second, I'm gonna have you click through this slide. So this is a patient who's also presenting with classic facial features of a syndrome. And in his case, the first thing I, I hope you would notice is his relatively flat face, which you can see in certain ethnicities, and it's not a um, diagnostic finding in and of itself. A very flat nasal bridge. If you think back to John o Lancaster, he's a very prominent narrow nasal bridge. This young man has a very flat, almost concave uh, nasal bridge. The other thing you would note is that his palpebral fissures, John O's fissures were down slanting. Okay, David. Here, if you measure, put just a straight line between the nasal fissure and the temporal fissure, they're up slanting. It's more prominent for me on the left than the right. And another classic finding is, David, he's got two epicanthal folds. One more click. And that's, that's abnormal. Um, if you were to look at his palms, he would have one dominant crease, which is not normal. And that actually has to do with hypomotility uh, in utero. Um, now, if everyone were to close their eyes, you don't need to, and picture a patient with Down syndrome. Next slide, please. I suspect this is what you would picture. And this is a gentleman with Down syndrome. And what I'm bringing up here is that biases can include how we think about pigmentation for certain disorders. And for whatever reason, people tend to think about white folks as having Down. Down is, is almost purely a non-inherited mutation. It happens spontaneously. It has to do with evolution, as I started off with, and really knows no boundaries in terms of ethnicities and race and identities in any way. But for whatever reason, we tend to think of white people, Caucasians, hypopigmented people as most likely to have Downs. But in fact, that's, there's no truth to that whatsoever. And when I would further say, going back, and David, you don't need to, but that earlier slide, to me, because of these biases you carry around, to me, it doesn't jump out at me as quickly as this, this individual has Down. The other teach, teaching point is that whether a disease is rare or not actually can change throughout the lifespan of the disease. So Down is actually not rare for the first 40 years of a typical person with Down's life, meaning there's more than 200,000 people at any given time in this country that have Down. After 40, it becomes rare, and that's because of the morbidity and mortality associated with some of the later manifestations of Down, such as ALL and early onset um, Alzheimer's. This is Barry Kohler. Barry Kohler is the physician in chief and also the vice president for, for uh, medical and scientific affairs at Rockefeller University. Barry gave Graham Rounds about a year ago. He's a wonderful mentor and really, the, for me, the epitome of the physician scientist and everything that both of those words represent for us. Um, Barry was the person who first got me interested in hermansky pudlak syndrome. And I was fresh out of training. I didn't really know the path my career was gonna take. I thought I wanted to be in clinician education. I was associate program director for the program that Barry charged me with running. And he asked me if I'd be willing to participate in the care of these patients that just, as he put it, just need a good doctor, Samuel. And it was really through that that I, that my career developed in the way that it has and that Amy so kindly described for you. Barry, furthermore, uh, made very important contributions in the world of Glansman's thromosthenia. And it was through that work that we've, we've learned some important things and we can keep moving with slides, David. Before I get to that, I do wanna talk about the differential diagnosis. And the reason I bring it up is that the internists have a toolkit. And to me, one of the most important tools in that kit is the differential diagnosis. And what I want, the reason I'm bringing it up is first of all, obviously, if one's gonna generate a differential, it can very well include rare diseases. And hopefully you'll leave this talk today with some examples of that. But a broader point I wanna make is that it, what, it's one of the things that distinguishes internists from other folks. It distinguishes us from our colleagues in surgery. It distinguishes us from OBGYNs. 
it really is fundamental to the identity of an internist. And in the busy, hectic, demanding lives that all of us have, I want to submit to you, you should not lose your attachment to the differential diagnosis. Now, I don't think you need to generate a differential for every patient and every visit. I, I don't, I think it's overwhelming to try. And I think one of the reasons why sometimes we lose that thread a little bit is we, perhaps we're trying to apply it too broadly and we just can't always. We just can't. You cannot generate a vast differential for every patient you're seeing in the emergency room. And I'm kind of giving you permission to not. But I'm also suggesting to you, if you get through a week, or certainly if you get through a month, and you've not done that for any of your patients, that's probably not so great either, just in terms of your core identity as an internist. And I'm talking about general internists like me who work in primary care or hospital medicine. I'm also talking about specialists. Okay, David, thank you. Platelets, platelets are gorgeous. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on platelets, partly because of Barry, but also because of, you know, a fundamental aspect of, of Hermansky Pudlack is platelets. This is just a really beautiful EM. These are mega, this is a megakaryocyte, and you can see platelets, um, again, for me, really beautifully um, budding off of the megakaryocyte. And this is a schematic. Alpha granules are important. Dense bodies are important. All of it's important. Um, deficiencies or mutations in a number of these constituents of platelets have real consequences for patients in terms of their qualitative function not their quantitative. They will, patients with disorders, like I'm gonna talk about in a moment, they will have a normal number of platelets, but how those platelets work is the issue. So this gets back to Barry Kohler and, and his work with the Glansman's population, he traveled all over the world to do that work and collecting samples from patients early in his career as a physician scientist. He was able to elucidate, he was not the only one, but was held, able to help elucidate the importance of the 2B3A receptor, which we all know so well. And a mutation in that receptor is responsible for the, for the bleeding diathesis and the frequent hemorrhage that you see in the Glansman's population. Okay, so we do this as a quiz. We're sticking with Barry. I love Barry Kohler. And so we're sticking with him for another moment. And which drug ultimately resulted from his work? You've got four choices. Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay, votes are in. Okay, thank you. You did all right. Um, so Eliquis, Reapro, Agristat, you know, so, so but the writing answer was Epsiximab. And, and it's a very important, it's really, you know, saved hundreds of thousands of lives, uh, particularly in the, in the patient population. People have had to get coronary stents, as you all know. Perifaban is another drug in the same class that works at the level of 2B3A, but Barry's work really got, got us to the point of having Reapro to bring to our patients. And, and uh, you know, we in the world really owe him a tremendous debt of gratitude around that. So I, I'm not a mnemonic person, but for anyone studying for the boards, this is the mnemonic for Glansman's. Yeah. And then for, again, for the trainees, I did look what's most common in terms of questions that get asked about platelets. And they, they like to know that you've thought about and understand the two different types of hemostasis. You can jump forward two slides, David. And there, you know, there's two paths to hemostasis. One is platelet dependent, and that's referred to as primary hemostasis. And these disorders that we're talking a little bit about, Glansman's, Hermansky-Pudlak. Great platelet is a, there's a mutation in the alpha 
granule. And that what gives gray platelet patients uh, the bleeding diathesis. You can see it in large platelet syndrome as well, the alpha granule abnormality or deficiency. Secondary hemostasis, as everyone knows, is dependent on factors. And there's a host in this group as well. And we can keep on moving. So this is a Virginia Apgar. You know, again, this is just to remind everybody the importance of women in medicine and the importance of women in our understanding of genetic disorders. Everyone, I think, will remember the Apgar score, which is Virginia Apgar, Dr. Apgar, was, was responsible for creating as a way, you know, in the, in the delivery uh, uh, room of evaluating um, an infant's, a brand new infant's uh, viability at that time, as really was around viability, but also described for us and described really for patients and for young moms. Um, I'm gonna have to deal with this. I don't think I can move, I apologize. I'll talk loud. Uh, they've been doing some refacing some work in this building in my office at Columbus Circle. Anyway, Dr. Apgar was a really made tremendous contributions, and, and you know we're all grateful, both as parents and also as physicians. Okay, so why don't we, David? Just in the interest of time, I'm, let's not do this as a quiz. So this is a separate patient. He comes to you. He's a 40-year-old, and he tells you he's really had lifelong issues with visual acuity, and he notes that it's it's really nocturnal acuity. Um, he, he further notes, because of an incident in New York City where he was crossing a street, and this is a real patient, this is the patient that I saw, and he almost got hit by a cab and he flat out never saw that cab. Um, and then he also has noted more recently some flashing lights in his central vision, which I think everyone understands flashing lights is really kind of an emergency signal for us and would imply in the absence of everything else, and this is not about retinal detachment, but in the absence of everything else, you would still want to get this gentlemen quickly to, to an ophthalmologist. Next slide. You examine, examine him, normal facies, normal head and neck exam, normally reactive pupils, extraocular muscles are intact, no nystagmus. But you do notice, and this is just direct ophthalmoscope, you do notice hyperpigmented, what are sometimes called bony spicule looking for, uh, formations at the lateral aspect of his retina. And then furthermore, that his optus disc, relative to other optus discs that you've seen, looks kind of pale. And for the trainees, the, the, when I say relative to others you've seen, it's to remind you, it's really to remind all of us that you just got to look at a lot of normals in order to know abnormal when you see it. And, and people who have worked with me at the Ryan will hear me say, go ahead and get that direct ophthalmoscope out when you're doing an annual visit. Turn the light off, keep doing your interview, you can crack the door if there's not much light in the room, but that allows the pupils to dilate up a little bit. And then go ahead and do that exam. The patient won't mind. If they've got hypertension, you can be looking for those classic findings, but you're also just familiarizing yourself, as you should with all aspects of the physical, um, with what normal looks and feels and sounds like. Next slide. This is his pedigree. And so when I'm seeing patients, you know, I typically see patients and it's a rule out HPS. I always do a pedigree and I'm trying to understand for HPS, you know, anyone else in the family with albinism, anyone else in the family who died unexpectedly young from a lung disease and things of this sort. And so in, in this gentleman, he's the one with the arrow, of course, and this gentleman, there's a bunch of things you can say about this pedigree. First of all, it's multiple generations and it's impacted every generation. And that's important. You can see that when there's an affected parent, there seems to be predictably an affected offspring. We have this gentleman and this woman, they've got three kids with this syndrome. This woman uh, had a baby with this woman and they've got a son with this syndrome. These had this heterosexual pair have two kids. And so based on that, you can make a lot of assumptions about the inheritance pattern this classically, without skipping any generations, is more likely to be dominant. It doesn't mean it's dominant, but it's more likely. The fact that it affects both men and women makes an X-linked disorder far less likely. Some X-linked dominant disorders will be seen in women, of course. Mitochondrial disorders, by and large, are seen in, women, in men. And so um, 
Did I get that right? I got that right. So, so all of these things can help you think about what's most likely in terms of the inheritance pattern. And the answer for this one is autosomal dominant with full penetrance. And the reason we say full penetrance is if we, when I talked to this gentleman, he really described all the same symptoms that he was experiencing themselves. I don't remember the next slide. Uh, okay, so then we're referring to the ophthalmologist. We're really worried about retinitis pigmentosa, which again is an AD um, disease. And we're wondering what should we ask the ophthalmologist to do? And I'm not gonna run you through this just in the interest of time, but the broader point I'm trying to make is that when you are referring to a specialist and you're thinking about a rare disease, it's important not to assume that the specialist will know that rare disease. Now, retinitis pigmentosa, though it's rare, is common enough that certainly retinal specialists will have seen patients with retinitis pigmentosa. My patients, HPS, I, I routinely refer to a retina specialist because they have retinal albinism. And by and large, the, my experience is they will have seen other patients with HPS but I don't think you should make the assumption there's thousands of rare diseases and it's important if you're thinking about a particular one to lay that out for the specialist. And I don't believe it's inappropriate to even say what tests make sense to you. For this particular disorder, um, some of these really don't make sense. The one that does is number four and number three and number two not so much number one necessarily, depending on the patient's light sensitivity, but probably all of the above. This is Bill Gall. He gave us a quote at the beginning of the talk. Bill's a great friend of mine, um, and he is the head of the NHGRI at the NIH, also was the person who created the uh, Undiagnosed Disease Network at the NIH, which has been responsible for diagnosing at this point thousands of patients who did not have a known disorder until they shared their information with the NIH. And it's been a, really just a tremendous contribution to the lives of, of people struggling with very serious symptoms and signs without knowing why. You can keep going. Bill has made contributions of his own in three different rare diseases, cystinosis, alcaptonuria, and hermansky pudlak syndrome. And Bill and his lab get, re get credit for describing most of the known mutations for HPS. They're now 11. Alcaptonuria is, is quite a rare uh, genetic metabolic disorder. It was the first inborn error of metabolism described back at the turn of the last century. And some of the features of it include that infected individuals will have dark urine. And the reason I bring it up, apart from my great fondness for Bill Gall and, and tremendous regard for the contributions that he's made, and he's really just a, really a wonderful, wonderful person. When we hear dark urine, we, we're apt to think of one diagnosis, paroxysmal, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, or I think when you're talking about you know, syndromes that cause that, that's the one that comes to mind. Why that does, I have no idea. And the reason I say that is the following. In terms of pure prevalence, l captanuria is thought to be present in about one in every 250,000 live births in this country. It may be a little less than that. Maybe it's more like one and a half million. Um, H, uh, you know, HP, I lost my train of thought. PNH, about one in a million. So from a pure prevalence standpoint, alcaptonuria is more common. I would submit that most in the audience are not familiar with this, this disorder. And, and really, I would suspect everyone in the audience has heard of PNH. And again, it's just really kind of the culture of medicine and how some things get passed down to us as being important in the differential, others never mentioned. But to me, there's no logical reason often why that's the case. And, and really for any given symptom or sign, there's likely to be many reasons that, that could account for it. I'll give you a separate example just for fun. You know, if you think about sterile pyuria, so these are patients we see all the time who have white cells in the urine but have a negative culture. There's a differential for that, and it's actually not that short, but we tend to just think they don't have a bacterial infection and therefore, I don't know. You know, but I'm just trying to make this point that the differential is really fundamental in the internist toolkit and it's fun and it helps us think more broadly about our patients. Okay, so we're gonna, this is, we're gonna, 
I think we'll do this last series of slides and then just wind up again, just in the interest of time. So th this jumps off the page. I've never seen one of these patients, but these, you know, these are very, very obvious anthomas. And if you look at the appearance of the patient's skin, all relatively young patients. And you also see pretty prominent tenderness involvement as well. Next slide, David. There's two types of familial hypercholesterolemia, and all of you know standard FH accounts for somewhere around 10, 15% of patients with hyperlipidemia that we're seeing every day in our practices and treating. There's another form, which is severe familial hypercholesterolemia. And that we don't talk a lot about because it's quite rare, um, but it was very important, and, and I'm going to share with you why. Brown and Goldstein. Uh, won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1985. And they worked with these patients. Um, both of them, when I was at UT Southwestern, were there. And, you know, it's really just one of these moments where you're like, I know I'm in the presence of giants. I will never say hello to them. But in any event, they, they worked with severe familial hypercholesterolemia patients and were able to elucidate the importance of the receptor in, in the disease state that we saw so obviously in, in the earlier slide. Okay, so we're gonna finish up just talking about rare diseases, just in terms of folks who are early in their careers and the role that it could play. So this, this is the triad. This is the classic mission-oriented triad that we think about in academic medicine. It's research, education, and clinical care. In my talk, hopefully I've indicated to you in one way or another that when you think about rare diseases and taking up work related to these, these patients, you can have an important impact in all aspects of, of the mission of an academic center and all aspects of your own personal mission for the course of your career. What I'll say on a personal note, and again, Dr. Rosenberg was so kind about talking about this, is that the clinical care you know, my experience with the HPS population, but it's not exclusive to that population because it really has been an interest of mine in general to care for patients with rare diseases. With the exception of cystic fibrosis, where I think they've done tremendous work really creating a network of providers across the country and increasingly across the globe. But other rare disorders, um, many of these patients, their common experience in healthcare is no one knows about their, their disorder. People generally are a little bit uneasy when they bring it up and really don't know the first thing about what to do. And I just want you to think about the fact that, you know, when you have those meaningful interactions with patients, as I know you all do, think about that doubled or tripled with the patient who's telling you, you know, before I came to know you, no one really ever cared about my disease, even though it's like central to my life. So that kind of thing. But also certainly in education, as I maybe got through today, just in terms of this talk, and certainly in research, there's so much research to be done. You know, a lot of it is just in basic mechanisms, cellular mechanisms that manifest in the phenotypes that we see associated with all these different disorders. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm happy to take any questions. I really, really appreciate your time and attention and interest in this topic. And again, thank you. Uh, Dr. Seward, that was a wonderful talk. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things is how to get rid of anchoring in the electronic medical record. Things are carried on almost as if it were tattooed with the wrong diagnosis and it gets carried on and on and on, and it's hard to erase it. You can erase it in the final um, area, but when you look at the notes, you can't change those notes, and they get cut and pasted into uh, subsequent notes. So that's a tremendous disservice to the patient, I think, when, when you wind up thinking about the patient in, in the wrong direction because of that type of anchoring. The other issue I've, uh, I find uh, true, especially in rare disorders, because I, I also see some of these patients, is that very few people feel comfortable in dealing with them and they wind up dismissing them uh, or calling it psychiatric or psychological. And then these patients become more and more stressed as they seek care. 
and it's not uncommon uh, in some of my own uh, experiences to have had a 18 year old high school student see 22 physicians before getting a diagnosis. So the, the issue was how to cope with those and how to help our patients cope with those, I think, barriers to uh, a, a better care. Uh, and, and going to the NIH, it can be a good experience. Uh, in one of my cases, unfortunately, they did muscle biopsies for a family and then uh, something happened to the lab and uh, they lost all the specimens and asked the patients to go back and get re-biopsied. And the patients were furious and, and didn't want to do that. But uh, NIH is a wonderful resource. Yeah, well, just briefly to comment on all your, your important points, Noma. In terms of anchoring, um, I always feel it's important to say, I, I don't think it started with the medical record, the electronic medical record. I really think it's no. been an issue even before that, but I agree with you. In, in some ways, the electronic record um, facilitates anchoring, and we all have to be sensitive to that. But really, Kahneman's work is about what's happening up here, right? It's really not about what's happening on the page. It's how we come to think about patients, and it's just the human condition. We should not feel guilty about it, but we just, you know, the very fact that we talk about it, I think, is so helpful in terms of uh, as a guard against it. There's a lot of bias out there. I think there's a lot we can do. One of the great developments in healthcare, in my view, is patient advocacy and patient advocacy organizations such as the HBS network, but also the multi-team approach that we take to complex patients. And I think a lot of times some of these biases can also be mitigated by other teams, like a genetic counselor or a social worker. And just over time that we're all just finding ways it's a challenge for every single one of us finding ways to manage our own biases and embrace as fully as possible the diversity of humanity. Samuel? Yes. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. I agree with uh, Norma uh, completely. Um, I'm curious. I'm, I'm, I'm a big advocate of uh, a complete physical examination, um, including the eyes. If, if you were to hazard a guess, um, what percentage of the house staff watching this right now has a st uh, has an ophthalmoscope on their person? A hundred percent, Oscar. Is that right? <laughs> no, I think it's variable. I, I think the challenge that not just our house staff, right, all of us have is is managing the demands, you know. And and so one of the things I like about working at the Ryan Oscar, and I, I you know, your point's well taken. The physical exam can can be daunting particularly early in one's career, you have this idea, and I'm sure you would agree, Oscar, you have this idea, it's gonna take me, oh my God, it's gonna take me a half an hour. In fact, you can do a complete physical, particularly once you get facile with it pretty quickly, but it takes mm -hmm. some time to get to that point of being facile with it. And so what I see at the Ryan, and the Ryan is, you know, it's, it's largely primary care, and there's two types of visits. There are the established follow-ups, and the, there's the annuals, and I honestly, Oscar, with the annuals, I really think the house staff do a nice job evaluating those patients and they kind of understand, okay, this is my moment to really get a good history and really do a, a complete physical. And it's just, I would say further, um, and I'm sure you would agree with this too, that you never stop learning, you know, and Barbara Bates, I keep that textbook under my desk at my office at Morningside. And if I'm gonna start rounds in the morning, I will frequently, quickly be flipping through to, to remind myself, how do you do that particular maneuver? I wanna make sure I do it right. So it's just, it's a constant learning. There's a lot to the physical exam, but we, we all get your point that, you know, there are probably moments for every one of us where we could have done a more complete physical than we did. Yeah, it's I think the other thing I would call out, and I just thought about this this week, Oscar, and I do think it's important, there are, there are um, cultural barriers as well. And so I'm thinking about this Bengali woman that I saw at the Ryan with one of our really great interns um, earlier in the week, or second year, excuse me, a second year. And the challenge was that they, the patient presented in the you know, complete traditional cultural dress, her daughter did as well. And this patient was having some back pain. And I asked, and you would appreciate that I did, Oscar. I said, but well, did you look at the skin? 
you know, and, and I understood why the house staff said no, because it was uncomfortable to do that. You know, it was uncomfortable to cross that bridge culturally. Yeah. I, I just think that's part of the challenge of modern medicine. Oh, I, I, I agree with you 100 percent. But I, what you said before resonated with me. And that is that during training, what we learned to look at a thousand uh, fundi so that we, we have an idea imprinted in our minds as to what a normal fundus looks like. You don't have to be a retinal specialist to be able to diagnose everything, but you yep. know that you haven't seen this before because you've looked in a thousand eyes. And, and, and I think that every patient, uh, every uh, intern, a house staff member interacting with every patient for the first time should do a fundoscopic exam so that they in fact get better because it can be very daunting to do this uh, but if you don't do it, except, uh, I mean, I've spoken to house staff um, who have uh, done six fundoscopic exams in their training, oh, and only during a specific training uh, exercise when an ophthalmologist was showing them how to do it. That's, that's not a good thing. Yeah. Agree with all of it. Um, Dr. Singh is making a great point in the chat, Oscar, that that it is also true that, that the skills that we bring to bear change over time, and she's just pointing out the increasingly important role of, of um, bedside ultrasound as part of our diagnostic toolkit. But, you know, and I'm, I'm older, so, you know, Oscar and I in many ways are coming from the same perspective, but I'll say it just the same, and some of our trainees and our younger faculty will have heard me say this, the goal is, First of all, the goal is to be confident. You know, and the second goal, truly, I believe, is to, is to find joy in your work. And at least for me personally, and I'm just talking about my own experience, for me personally, you know, I have a decent skill set when it comes to the physical exam. It's not perfect. And I already told you, I look stuff up all the time to make sure I get it right. But it does contribute to my sense of joy. I mean, I love my job. I love being in this role, but it does contribute to my sense of joy. Um, and the broader point I would make, and it would get us back to, you know, one of the teaching points I was trying to share is I do think it's an expectation. I do think when our surgical colleagues, for example, call us in, they're making assumptions about this, you know, our physical exam skill set. And I do think it's an important part of the internist skill set or a toolkit. It's not the only tool in the kit, but it is one of them. And, and, and so, you know, just, just developing that over time, not beating yourself up if you don't know something, knowing it's a lifelong process, but certainly important. Any other, any other comments or questions? Um, Dr. Smith just typed, um, that the ability to admit the limitations of one's knowledge and need to utilize other resources to help the patient is a sign of a smart physician. Couldn't agree more, Mike, although I'm not aware of any limitations in your knowledge, but I couldn't agree more. I, I think, um, you know, humility, humility's pretty big, right? Including knowing what you don't know. Yep, that's really critical. I think there are no more questions and we're cutting close to our nine. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all again. It was really a joy for me to talk about, as I said, my favorite topic. Don't forget about rare diseases. They're fun to read about. Look for them on the subway. If you look, you'll see them. They're out there and uh, have, have a wonderful day and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.